Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this evening for a conversation with Denise Hines and AJ Magu for a conversation about Denise's book, The Brief and True Report of Temperance Flowerdew. My name is Talia, and I'm the events manager at Flyleaf. This season, our events sort of cover a little bit of everything. So we have some literary fiction, some romance. We have a new book by Dr. Bill Ferris, which is about the civil rights movement, and it's a photo book. Um, we also are hosting some young adult fantasy authors, as well as a memoir about surviving incarceration. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, I know it's a little bit of everything. Um, I do encourage you to look at our Crowdcast profile and to subscribe because we will notify you about any new events that we're booking on our calendar. Um, and we love seeing all of your, your faces, although, I mean, I guess it's not really faces, all of your names at our events. Um, I know it's not the same as in person, but I really do appreciate everyone who makes it out to these. If you'd like to support the store and our guests, please keep in mind that you can purchase the Brief Entry Report of Temperance Flowerdew from Flyleaf. We have a link just below our faces, and the author has generously donated 10 copies of her first book, Sally St. John's. So if you order the new book, we'll also include a copy of her first book. So it's a little two for one deal. And um, you can also uh, come into the store to order or uh, shop online, whatever works best for you. We're now open for browsing once again, so that it's Monday through Saturday from 11 to 5 p.m. All right, I will go ahead and introduce our authors tonight. Denise is a former literature professor and a PhD graduate of Duke University. She writes fiction, nonfiction, and poetry. She is the author of a scholarly work on Toni Morrison and the eco-thriller Sally St. John. A descendant of Louisa May Alcott, she lives in North Carolina. And tonight, Denise will be in conversation with Anna Jean Mayhew, Mayhew or AJ, whose first novel, The Dry Grass of August, won the Sir Walter Raleigh Award for Fiction, was a finalist for a book award from the Southern Independent Booksellers Alliance, and has been translated into seven languages. AJ followed that up with a second novel called Tomorrow's Bread, which she began writing while she was in residency in France. In the spring of 2019, AJ was selected for the TRIO program, which is a traveling exhibit of art, music, and literature that celebrates the inspirational power of great storytelling. A mother and grandmother, AJ lives with her Swiss-born husband and two cats in Hillsborough. All right, thank you both so much for joining us tonight. I'm great. It's great to have you here. Um, before we begin our conversation, I'm just going to take away my own video and audio to keep the focus on both of you. And when you're ready for questions, just let me know, and I'll pop back up to read out some questions for you from our audience. All right, y'all have the floor. Go ahead, Denise. <laughs> thank you, Talia. Um, yeah, thank you so much to uh, Flyleaf Books and Talia for uh, hosting this event. Uh, without independent bookstores, I don't know where I would be as a reader, let alone an author. Uh, and in the middle of a pandemic, my book was launched and I was desperate and anxious and terrified as to what that would mean. But luckily, bookstores and libraries stepped up, typically like they always do in terms of being incredibly important to culture. Uh, and so I'm really grateful that I can do this virtual event, and especially with a fellow North Carolina author, A.J. Mayhew, whose novels I have read and have just loved. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks. Uh, the Brief and True Report of Temperance Flower Dew is a novel about two remarkable women who actually were real historical figures. And I wanted to write about them because my sense of it was that um, their contribution to American history had been dismissed, understated, or erased. And so my purpose was to bring them to life, even though we know very little about them. But not just to celebrate them uh, in isolation as two women, but to see how they contributed to this mud and stick settlement on the edge of nowhere, and how what they had to do in order to first get themselves to agree to go, to embark on this journey, and then to survive once they got there. 
I mean, like so many of us, when we're preparing for any kind of new adventure or trip, our imagination takes over. And sometimes we visualize or imagine uh, the future in ways that are much too optimistic or rosy. And once we reach our destination, we're sorely disappointed. Well, compare that to what these two women must have experienced after a treacherous cross uh, Atlantic voyage, landing in uh, this new world, this verdant expanse, again, uh, that's uninhabited except by people who are, are, who are strange, strangers to you. And then to see the actual settlement, settlement and realize that there was political infighting, uh, already a shortage of food, and a hostile native population. So they aren't there but a few months, and already food becomes a, a major issue, and they enter into what was called the starving time. Uh, how in the world did these women negotiate that terrain and uh, and and how in the world did Jamestown as a whole actually survive? Um, so that was my goal as a writer was to try to imagine that based on very few facts about these two women. We know a little bit more about Temperance. She was the the wife of the first two governors of Virginia, not at the same time. <laughs> the first two colonial oh, governors of Virginia. Uh, and she was a woman who was remarkable in her own right. She owned land and uh, uh, did other, uh, engaged in other civic activities uncommon for women of the time. Uh, Lily was based on um, an archaeological find at Jamestown just a few years ago. The skeletal remains were found off the kitchen in a compost uh, of a teenage girl. And uh, the Jamestown actually did a facial reconstruction of her. And you can see her face as it was reconstructed in the museum at Jamestown. But nobody knows her name. Nobody knew anything about her. And uh, I said, OK, here we go. I've, I've got to give her a voice. Even though I don't know much anything about her, except perhaps what she looked like, I had to just create her story and hope that it was at least somewhat accurate. So that's the story of Jamestown and uh, well, not the story of Jamestown, but the story of how I came to write this book. And it, it was really uh, an exciting and fascinating adventure for me. Wow. <laughs> and uh, if I could indulge you all with a, a short five minute reading, uh, I'm going to go to a scene um, uh, that begins right at the end of the journey of what was called the Third Supply. This was a flotilla of ships sent by the Virginia Company from England to replenish Jamestown. And uh, Temperance is with the Third Supply, as are just very few women. Uh, and after a treacherous journey across the Atlantic Ocean, they're about to, to land, and Temperance begins to have some doubts as I'm sure most anybody would, given the situation. Her eyes tired from scanning the sea. Temperance rested her head against the gunwale and tried to breathe in calm. She knew that in her pronouncements to George Yardley, she had been rash, foolish. Determined as she was to make good on her word, to brave this new world, she was also utterly ill-equipped for it. The skills men possessed to survive in the wilderness had never been any part of her experience. She could not spear a fish, fell a tree, grow food, build a shelter, shoot fowl or game, or a hostile intruder if her life depended on it, which it surely would. She didn't even know how to cook or clean properly, that duty given over to servants. What she was good at was reading and mastering dense, arcane, and complex tomes of science, history, mathematics, and politics, much to the amazement of her family and friends, nearly all of whom regarded her skills as amusing parlor fare rather than a suitable vocation for a young woman. The one notable exception was her father, a successful notions merchant, a book lover himself, who had stocked the library for his precocious daughter. 
When she turned 13, he left her without mentor or patron when he succumbed to an infection brought on by an abscessed tooth. The memory of her father's winsome face engorged with poison, his gray eyes wide with incredulity and pain, brought on a stinging grief. She covered her face as if to block the image. In its place, she pictured herself in his lap, the smell of dye and copper on his hands as he opened the book with a reference of a monastic. Together they would gaze at the tooled leather, smell the glue in the binding, run their fingers lightly across the brutal paper and florid script. Script. Only then, after their silent ritual, would he and later she begin to read. She'd fall fast asleep against his chest, the vibrations from his voice more soothing than being rocked. Later, when she was too big for his lap, she'd read to him. After an exhausting day, trading voluminous quantities of buttons, thread, needles, and fabrics, he'd nod off a contented smile on his face. She'd sensed, as a very young child, that her father had dreamed a different life for himself, but had neither the will nor the temperament to pursue it. In the small fortune he had amassed, and with it the books he insisted they read together, he had granted her an unlicensed freedom to flout the boundaries of her birth, not just vicariously through print, but in the helter-skelter of an unfinished world. In the little time she had before she set sail, Temperance gathered as much information as she could, the best way she knew how, from the books, charts, maps, broadsides, and pamphlets that detailed discovery and exploration. She read about the treachery of a vast ocean with its deep water currents and sea monsters, of endless trees on an untouched continent, plentiful as porcupine quills, of native peoples, mysterious and beguiling, hostile and welcoming. Among the few possessions she was allowed to take with her on the voyage, she chose a scant two maps and five books, all related to America, which cost a pretty penny and what she studied and read over and over again. While indispensable to her, they were not nearly enough. She had come to this disturbing realization that rather than having achieved autonomy, she was more dependent on men than ever. And on one man in particular, whom she could trust to have her best interest at heart, if he were not already at the bottom of the sea. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got a couple of comments. One thing I'd forgotten that the details in that passage, but a couple of things jumped out at me, which is the broad scope of a classic education back then, with emphasis, you know, on languages and uh, Greek and Roman. And, the classics, which seem to have gone by the wayside in today's education. And the other yeah, thing, which, yeah, go ahead. And I'm sorry, just saying, which which would have not been afforded to a woman unless uh, someone in her family, most likely her father, would have insisted on it. Right. Which and in this the other case thing was that a, a bad tooth killed him, you know, an infected tooth. I mean, I made an appointment with my dentist today, so I'm, you know, <laughs> but 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 nowadays that what that wouldn't happen, right? I remember reading uh, in some historical work that uh, one of the biggest health problems, uh, I think, with the John Adams biography, but one of the biggest health problems of the 18th century was teeth. Teeth. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I can understand that. Yeah. Oh goodness. Even today, uh, my husband is Swiss, and when we've gone to Europe, um, one of the things that has been commented on is you can tell an American by their teeth. Hmm. That Makes generally sense. speaking, the middle part of the population does not do the cosmetic stuff that we do. And I, I was surprised to hear that. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I was wondering about uh, uh, about your books that I've read and, and enjoyed, and you were you were mentioning the setting and and how we kind of share that in that in common that that need to create the milieu first before we set, yeah. put our characters in it. Yes, I, uh, before we came on tonight, I had commented that 
one thing we really had in common was setting. Um, Denise writing about the beginning of a town and me writing about the ending of a town. The setting in my novel, I'll just give you the what I call my elevator pitch so people out there who haven't read it will know a little bit about it. In 1961, rumors of urban renewal fly through the black neighborhood of Brooklyn in downtown Charlotte, North Carolina. When the bulldozers roll, a grandmother is forced from the home she's lived in all her life. A minister stands by helpless as his wife's coffin is exhumed in a cemetery condemned by the city. In this Jim Crow setting, the mother of a biracial boy must hide her love for his white father. Two miles away in upscale white Myers Park, a woman is drawn into the conflict despite her husband's convention that the redevelopment is vital for Charlotte. Civic promises are broken, neighbors are torn apart, and century-old Brooklyn is demolished as city planners vie for the valuable acreage. So my book would be, would be empty without setting. And likewise, Jamestown being the very first uh, settlement in the New World, and um, so they were building from ground up and Brooklyn was being torn from the top down. Hmm. Yeah. And how did you uh, how did you prepare to write that particular scene and to create the setting? Well, I'm a native Charlottean. I moved to the Triangle area when I was 45 to prove I could get away from Charlotte so I could write about it. I was too close. <laughs> And um, I went back for a visit in 2008 for a high school reunion. And instead of taking the 77 out around the city and going down Moorhead, which I would normally do, I just for some reason took the Brookshire Freeway and went in town. And I knew Brooklyn was gone, but I'd been away 20 years at that point, And I really was startled by there was not a sign of it that it ever existed. So my mm. thought was what happened to the people. And that was the mm. genesis of it. And it stayed with me a couple of years. And then I started doing some research, mostly out of curiosity. And like you with Lily, I'm fascinated that you might have had a, a rendering of her face. But with Lily, you, you had to invent her. You had to make her up. And um, I did too. And it was based on a lot of research about people who live there. Yeah, I mean, in place and people are often inextricable. And once you have one in place, then you can start introducing the people or maybe vice versa. Yeah. But um, I, I had to go to Jamestown and I had to see yeah. what it was I had been reading about. Yeah. Uh, and there's, there's something uh, almost mystical about that experience. I mean, probably different for you because you didn't recognize anything where I was seeing it for the first time. Oh, yeah. Well, in your book, as I've shared with you, I was fascinated by the idea of that town, the, the residential part being on three acres. And those of you who are listening, try to imagine three acres. My husband and I live on a half an acre and I talked to my neighbors and I said, if you put this lot together and this lot together and this lot together, you've got Jamestown. And when I got, after I thought about that, I got out and walked it and it's tiny. <laughs> and then of course yeah. the outline buildings were there, you know, the, the glass maker and the, you know, the, the uh, food storage and all that. But the residences were on this tiny little piece of land. So you went there. Yeah. Yeah, I did, and it uh, it it um, it looks a little bigger than I had imagined. I did the same thing you did. I went outside and looked at the three acre lots that you know in this yeah. area. Uh, but when you get there, the trees there are very few trees, and most of the buildings are gone. So it's like a house that's empty. It always looks bigger than than when it's occupied. Um, but still, even so, it's just this little patch of land. And uh, occupied by these people with this, these uh, enormous, with this enormous uh, hubris and bravado and vision, 
uh, courage. Mm -hmm. uh, and the courage so, to give. Oh, the courage. Yeah. yeah, and then they just watched each other die like flies, and, and still they persisted somehow and, and stayed. Uh, but to go there and see it was really, really, truly remarkable. Um, and I had mentioned the museum next to the original historic Jamestown. Mm -hmm. And there are the actual skeletal remains of uh, the Jamestown residents, some of them who were buried there. Um, uh, well, you could see one who's, who's uh, I think his tibia had been broken. You could see that in the, the, the skeletal remains. And, and then there was Lily, whom I call Lily, whom I created. There was her facial reconstruction. And um, that was both eerie and, and just uh, fascinating, very rewarding too. Because sometimes you just know that when you embark on a project, uh, that it's the right one because things start to show up to confirm that what you're doing is right. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what happened when I went to Jamestown. I was deep into writing the novel at that point um, and probably wouldn't have turned back, but it was certainly nice to know that, yeah, this is what I should be doing. Yeah. I had something similar to that happen, and I'm so glad you brought that up, that we start doing something, we're drawn into doing something, and then these things happen that make it come to life. And what happened for me was a woman in Charlotte, I can't even remember now how I'm, yes, I do. I remember how I met her. I had found a book that was about the um, area that I was writing about, about Brooklyn, about Second Ward in Charlotte. And it had been written by these three women, one of whom had an unusual name, Vermel Ely. And I tried to find her and could not went on the internet not a trace of her and then I got an idea so I called the Charlotte I mean the uh, you know information on the phone and they had a number and I called it and this woman answered and I said I'm trying to find Vermel Ely this is Vermel she was about 85 <laughs> at the time and she, oh my gosh yeah and she connected me with a woman named Catherine Fry who has done a lot of documentaries about the area and Catherine and I have become dear friends. Catherine took me to a breakfast meeting that happens every, or back then before COVID, happened every Thursday morning at the House of Prayer in Charlotte. And it's a group of men who went to the high school in my uh, novel. And so I got to meet them. And that just made everything pop, you know, come alive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, a very strange thing happened to me while I was writing about Temperance and Lily. My my goal, my mission was to stay focused on Temperance and Lily. Yeah. And then all, all of a sudden, in the process of writing, I started hearing in my head these voices saying, wait a minute, write my story. Yeah. Write my story. And so it was so insistent and... Um, so kind of disturbing that I said, I just stopped and I said, okay. So I started writing about Hugh Price and Henry Collins and Priscilla Collins. And I had read about them in the histories of Jamestown, mm -hmm. but I really didn't have any intention of writing them that prominently into the novel until they started telling me to. And I mean, yeah. that sounds, yeah. uh, that sounds kind of out there, yeah. but, um, I don't know, maybe it was my subconscious just telling me to, that, here, you've got to include these people too. They they want a voice, they want their moment in the sun. I have to really underscore that. I think people think it's kind of twilight zone when you say my characters are talking to me. But uh, were they real, by the way, the Collins? Yes. Okay, and did you use their names in the book? I can't remember. Yes. Wow. See, I didn't do that. I didn't have any anybody who was real, but uh, but they were based on people who was who were real. And the one that that kept talking to me, and I kept ignoring him for a while, is this preacher who has the he's the second narrator. He became huge in the book, but he was niggling at me. I had him in sort of background to my main narrator, and he just wouldn't go away. And you know, of course. It's, it's our subconscious bringing all this up. 
But finally, I realized he was almost as important as my number one narrator. Hmm. He just wouldn't shut up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's amazing. I mean, and so, you know, I, I assume that a lot of that's a function of the subconscious and the conscious mind and the workings of the imagination and the mystery of, of creativity mm -hmm. or something else. I mean, yeah. you don't know. You just you just see it as a gift that comes mm -hmm. to you if you're still and you're receptive. Yeah. And yeah. I think I think that happens to a lot of people uh, in different areas and walks of life who have these um, sort of moments or epiphanies, these uh, the light goes on and they get an idea and they wonder where the heck did that come from? And it's the same kind of process. Mm -hmm. If we could bottle it and sell it and inject it or inject it I into know. arms, I mean, no. imagine. I'd buy it. I would buy it. <laughs> Yeah. But just one, uh, just one other comment about that. Um, in this, this, um, I'm starting this other work that uh, is still in the very early stages, so I don't want to talk about that too much. But I, the other day, I was writing, and I, uh, the character came to me, and I said, "Well, I'm going to name him Jerome." And I thought, "Where the heck did that name come from, Jerome?" So um, within five minutes, I had to do a quick Google, Google search for some information that would go in the scene with this Jerome. And the website I went to, the director of this organization I was checking into, guess what his name was? Jerome. Jerome. Ah, that was five minutes later. Oh. And then later that night, um, another incident happened in which the name Jerome popped up. So I don't know, maybe it's just your alert to that name because you you're using it uh, or else there's something at work that really is truly amazing and, and that we haven't figured out yet. Well, I've got one last thing to say about my connection with you. When you first got in touch with me about reading the book and I was tickled to do that, especially when I started reading it and realized how good it is. Um, oh, thank you. you. You mentioned Toni Morrison and the work you had done with her. And I had just been looking into Toni Morrison because of, um, well, my concern about accusations of cultural appropriation. And I wanted to see what she had to say about it. And I sent you that quote that I found of her. She called it, this is misquoting, but it's the essence, imagination rather than appropriation. And I love that love that but that link right. between us the fact that you were a Toni Morrison scholar and I had just been doing research on her I'm now reading Paradise by the way which was the only one I had not read. yeah ah uh, yeah that's a that's a challenging work Paradise it is it's hard to follow the you know the the sections change and a name is there and there are some connections, but it's not easy to follow. It's not easy to read. Mm -hmm. Well, in terms of cultural appropriation, since you raised that issue, um, how have you dealt with it as a writer in your, both your books? Yeah, pretty much by ignoring it. <laughs> you know, I just, I am a Southerner born and reared in Charlotte in the South. And if I didn't include black characters, that would be a lie. And um, I grew up with some of the people who are in my books. And I read recently Michael Chabon, uh, The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clays, one of his. And in a, in a re interview with him, he called cultural an accusation of cultural appropriation censorship. And I really believe that. So I just kind of ignore it. It has been brought up to me. And I, my reaction to it is sort of, oh, really? And then I get quiet. And, you know, it's, and it's okay. I mean, I have black narrators. I have white narrators. Um, James Baldwin's most famous book, Giovanni's Room, is two white gay men in Paris. There's not a black person in the book. And his publishers told him, this was in the 50s, your followers aren't going to want to read that book because it's not set in the black world. Hmm. Thanks, Interesting. For, thanks for asking that question. You can tell I've thought about it a lot. Yeah. 
I mean, I certainly understand the concerns and um, the ways in which uh, cultural appropriation has been uh, something that has uh, served to uh, disserve uh, minority cultures. Mm -hmm. And I think that my goal as a writer um, is to try to be as true to every character I create mm -hmm. uh, and try to inhabit the character as best I can, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is probably one of the the most uh, unique and profound ways of trying to walk in somebody else's shoes. I, I don't know. How do you, un how do you understand? I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no. Well, I was thinking you could carry it out to an extreme and say that women have no right to have a male narrator and men have no right to have a female narrator. If that was so, we wouldn't have Karenina or Bovary, or just as examples. And to me, Tolstoy, in that penultimate chapter in Karenina, when she goes batty and goes to the train station, he got totally into, I've been where she was, you know, and, mm -hmm. and so bully for him. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, but, but uh, what a fantastic and fabulous way to try to understand somebody whose experience is so different than yours than to try to imagine them on the page. And you did that because these people came from 1600s in England. And I'm assuming you never lived in England in the 1600s. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you want to take questions? What do you think? Sure. Hey, Talia. All right. Hi, I'm back. Um, I am happy to read off any questions from our audience members. If there's anybody watching who's wondering anything, uh, sorry, my dog is barking. Um, but that is what you get from, for um, working from home. Uh, <laughs> What's your dog's name? My dog's name is Pluto. And then right now I'm actually at my parents' house and they have two dogs as well. So there's a lot of dog chaos going on um, around here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Around uh, here, too, my son is visiting with his 90-pound African lion hound, and I've got two little tiny kittens. So it's been an interesting, yeah, um, an interesting zoo. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I actually have a question for you, Denise. Um, so in this, this novel, you, you write from the perspective of um, someone who is really privileged and has been attended and given access to education and all of these things and therefore lived a very documented life um and then somebody who's from a much different uh part of society and therefore was hardly documented at all to the point where we don't even know her name um right. except for the you know the name you've given us can you talk a little bit about um the decision to open the story up beyond the documented um, to tell the stories of those people who, you know, were not given those opportunities or didn't have those privileges. Yeah, that's where uh, history and research come into play because even though uh, Lily, uh, the real life Lily had no name, uh, I, I think I read enough to understand what people from her particular social class endured in the early 17th century. And so I could, I could cobble together to some extent what kind of life she may have had and what experiences uh, she might have uh, gone through um, and perhaps how she might have fared at Jamestown. Um, so if she were uh, from the servant class, then there every indication that her ability to survive at Jamestown might have been superior to that privileged woman she served. Um, but uh, so much of what I had to do with Lily was to to imagine her uh, emotionally, uh, in, in addition to the the, the uh, couturements of her external life, so to speak. Um, so um, it was a balancing act between reading the history about the people of England in that time period and different 
social classes, and then just making her unique, making her stand out because she had to have been unique to, to do what she did and to make the kind of sacrifice she made, whether she made it willingly or not. I'm being a little cagey here because I don't know if everybody's read the novel, but whether she made the sacrifice willingly or not, she still made the ultimate sacrifice without which Jamestown might not have survived. And this, where would this country be, so to speak, in terms of trajectory? Right. Did you have her hole in your mind before you saw the recreation of her face? Uh, um, yeah, I think I think I saw the the facial uh, recreation before I she was fully formed in my mind. Okay. Yeah, I, okay. yeah. So I saw her face, and then I think that everything else came from that. Okay. Yeah, because and the I, article that I read um, had that photo, okay. and that just kind of blew me away. And um, and then I just went from there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I have another question for you. Um, so you've written the, the first book you wrote was is an eco thriller. And then this book is historical fiction about colonial America. Um, do you where do you where do you fall on the I, I don't know, what do you read, first of all, in terms of the genres? And then is there some connection that led you from one to the other, or is it just things that interest you in different realms? Hmm. Yeah, that's a really thoughtful question. Um, well, I'm, I'm an, uh, a former English professor, so I've read deeply and widely. Um, mm -hmm. And I read a lot as a kid. My mother was a voracious reader. All my brothers and sisters are readers. And so we read whatever each other had. We still do. We still trade books. So I read everything and anything. Um, but historical fiction really is my sort of my genre, uh, literary historical fiction, not historical fiction per se as, a, as uh, in isolation. Um, but what happened with Sally St. John's is I read a book by uh, Percival Everett called I Am Not Sidney Pachier. And it was oh. satirical. It was hilarious. And to take a break from what I considered my more serious historical fiction, I said, I'm just going to write this satirical romp and have fun just so I remember that it's supposed to be enjoyable to be a writer. So... <laughs> I think I kind of have done myself, might have done myself somewhat of a disservice because you can't pigeonhole me by what I've written so far. Um, but um, I think uh, just when an idea comes to me and I run with it and it, that I don't run out of gas before I hit the finish line is how I decide on what I'm going to write. Yeah. Well, now you've intrigued me. I want to read the first book. You said, <laughs> right. You said eco thriller? Eco thriller. It's a thing. What is it? <laughs> I've never heard that term. What does it mean? Well, it's it's a thriller that involves uh, the e that involves ecology. So oh. it it's uh, green literature. It's about climate change, um, yeah. and uh, but it's also a, a sort of a you know a heart pumping romp from uh, one end of the spectrum to the other as Sally tries to save the world full from ultimate uh, pollution and destruction. Wow, I've got to read it, <laughs> especially with what's going on today. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I just a you know a question that I'm sure people watching are curious to hear. So you've talked a little bit about what you're working on, what you're writing right now, both of you. Um, I believe if you want to share anything else about that, um, and then also what are you reading right now that you're enjoying? Mm -hmm. You want to go? No, you go ahead. Okay. Um, my third novel is also set in Charlotte. And while I didn't plan it, it seems like I, get, I went from 1954 with the first book to 1962 to 65 with the second book. And now I'm in 1972 with the third book. And I did not plan that, but it just kind of <laughs> came out that way. And I am, I'll say just 
a little bit because it's like what Denise said. It's um, it's very um, ethereal right now, and I don't want to blow it away by saying what it's about. But it does deal with gay issues in the South in the early 70s. And um, I've never been, it's the main two characters right now are men. I've never been a gay man in the South in the 1970s, but I'm having a wonderful time researching it and learning a lot about it. And I did have a dear, dear friend who, who was that character. So, um, and then what I'm reading, as I said, I just read, um, Parad I'm in, in the middle of Paradise by Toni Morrison. And um, I just finished, as I lay dying, I had a really hard time getting through that book. I mean, there were <laughs> sentences that were paragraphs, and I couldn't find a period. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, both both Toni Morrison and Faulkner really make you work for it. Absolutely. <laughs> and I wish I could say that the work is worth it. I had a hard time with As I Lay Dying, but I was determined to get through it. And I just read um, The Great Gatsby for about the fourth time. I'm intrigued by it because it's a tiny little book compared to what comes out today. It's like 50,000 words or something like that. And it's just magnificent. I, I just, you know, it's a story about guilt and about wealth and, you know, anyway. And I've read, I guess, just about every nonfiction, uh, pop culture, political book that has come out in the past two years. And um, that's a lot. That's a lot. It's a lot, including Michelle Obama, her becoming, which I thought was magnificent. And for uh, my birthday last week, I got a copy of Obama's latest book, and uh, The Promised Land. And I'm just starting to read that. But I love to read current political nonfiction. Mm -hmm. Denise? Uh, well, I am I just started, uh, I don't know if it's going to turn into a novel, I hope so, but it, uh, it the three main characters are grandmothers, and one of the reasons I chose grandmothers is because I think they are another underserved po uh, portion of our population. Uh, they are undervalued. Uh, I don't think that our society understands the extent to which grandmothers constitute the the fabric, the the uh, the sort of foundation of uh, society. So, um, and I didn't want to turn them into you know super cops or astronauts or or something that was outside their perhaps typical uh, arena of experience. I wanted them to. I want them to be engaged in what grandmothers typically do uh, in terms of the family, and that is to uh, to to be the cement that holds it together. And that's sort of a cliche, um, but they do. I'm hoping that in the in this new work that um, I can convey how important they are uh, to culture, just like my grandmothers were to me. Yeah. Um, and and yet, in some ways, I think their uh, contributions uh, just go unrewarded and unrecognized. Yeah. Um, in terms of what I'm reading, well, I just finished The Dry Grass of August and absolutely oh. loved it. Thank As I, I was telling AJ earlier, I got to a port, I got to a section in the novel that really, really, really upset me, and I threw my book down and scared my cat. <laughs> um, that just that's a real compliment too thank you yeah that's, that's a real compliment i did finish the book but it was very hard to do that i read a gentleman in moscow Me too. Uh, and also great yeah, um, yeah. Funny, yeah funny funny and so serious and deep ah oh, it's a wonderful book yeah and i just finished uh christina baker klein's the exiles uh, of course i read orphan train that's just a wonderful book and also sometimes I, de I love to read and reread New Age works, uh, probably in the same way, AJ, that you like to read uh, con uh, political discourse. Um, but I'm reading Eckhart Tolle's uh, The New Earth, uh, mm -hmm. and I, I reread Deepak Chopra's Ageless Body, Timeless Mind. I might have screwed that title up. Um, but um, in a pandemic, yeah. and uh, with so much going on and uh, uh, 
uh, in the world that is so disturbing. Sometimes I just have to uh, read a little bit of Eckhart Tolle and Deepak Chopra and Carolyn Meese. Yeah, yeah recenter yourself. Absolutely. <laughs> I have one comment about your novel in progress. What would the Obamas have done without the grandmother in the way? Right, right. Michelle's mother. Right. She, she brought a stability, um, a regular thing from home. You know, she had been part of uh, Sasha and Malia's lives since they were born. And I just think that has never been uh, touched on enough. Mm. Not to mention Barack's grandmother raised him. Yeah, that's right. He was reared by his grandmother. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Good point. All right. Um, I am not seeing any audience questions, so we are going to go ahead and wrap up. Uh, I want to give a few quick reminders that if you'd like to purchase a copy of the Brief and True Report of Temperance Flower Do and get a free copy of Sally St. John's along with that, uh, shop at Flyleaf. Uh, the link's right below our faces. And you can also come in to shop in person now. We're open for browsing Monday through Saturday from 11 to 5. Um, also a reminder to check out our upcoming events because a lot of cool stuff going on. Actually, Denise, you mentioned reading a Christina Baker Klein book. She'll actually be participating in a Flyleaf event later this season. Um, so that's one you won't want to miss. And again, a huge thank you to both of you, Denise and AJ. It's been such a treat to have you join us tonight. And I really appreciate it. Total treat for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Same, same here. Thank you so much. And a question. Sorry. A question about the purchase of the book. Mm. Are, are, is Flyleaf mailing them out? Or yes, we okay. offer shipping, shipping, curbside pickup, um, and in-store shopping right now. So okay. any way that works for you, we're, we're happy to work with you. Okay, because I have to tell Denise that I gave the, the ARC copy away to a dear friend who's writing a book <laughs> set in, um, in uh, North New York, but it's in the 17th century, and I told her the dialogue and the and the journal in uh, in Flower Do would really be helpful to her. And she's reading it right now, and she's loving it. So uh, I'm gonna, I want to I want to purchase it because I want to get the first book. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Well, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, yeah. I'll actually I'll email you. We'll figure it out. Okay. All right. Um, have a good night, everybody. To everybody who's watching, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And I'm going to go ahead and say good night. Thank you. Thank you, Talia. Thank you. Thanks, Denise. Thank you.